Father God, this is the cry of our heart this morning as we worship and praise and honour You and we just acknowledge the greatness of You. Those that are home now listening or watching on, Father God, we just acknowledge the greatness of You, great God, and we acknowledge Your love for us, Father. And it's not just for those here, it's not just for those that are watching, but for all humanity. You love humanity so much. And this morning, we just thank You, Father, that You made a way so that humanity could know You, could, could, could not just know You, but have a personal, intimate relationship with the Creator of the universe. It's extraordinary. And it's nothing of our doing. And this is why we give You thanks. This is why we have to stand and worship and praise You, because it's Your mercy and love that through the death and resurrection of Christ, it's made a way so that we can, we can call You Father. And so we thank You this morning. Lord, as we come to hear from Your Word, we just pray again that You'd speak to our hearts. And please, Lord, not, may it not be just me trying to, to, to muster up some sort of energy and whatever it might be, but we need You, Holy Spirit, not, not by wise or persuasive words, but a demonstration of the Spirit's power. We, we call upon You this morning and we just pray that You'd soften our hearts for what You wanna say to us. We need You, great God, we need You. We need You in our personal lives and we need You in this, this city, this nation, this world, great God. So come, speak to our hearts and soften our hearts for what You wanna say this morning. We commit these things to You and we just pray these things in Jesus' Name. Amen. Amen. Hey, it's great to be, yeah, feel free, grab a seat. You're already doing that, good job. Uh, it's great to be here this morning. Thank you, Ben, so much as well for leading us and uh, a privilege and honour to share with you this morning as well. Now, we just have started this series last week. We started, uh, in essence, this series about being light in the darkness. And in the Bible, throughout the Bible, there's different uh, aspects or there's different imagery, is probably a better word, about how it describes as Christians, as followers of Christ, that uh, people can be the light in, in the darkness. They can be the light uh, uh, where there's darkness, where there's brokenness, to be a healing agent uh, in the world around us. Now, there's other sort of aspects of that as well. Jesus spoke about that. <clears throat> Excuse me. Jesus spoke about that. He said, you're the light of the world. He said, you're the salt of the earth. And we know that back uh, in, in that day uh, that, you know, there was no such thing as refrigerators. And so salt uh, was certainly a way that helps the food uh, taste better, but it also prevents the food from spoiling or prevents the meat from spoiling. And in the same way, Jesus says, you're the salt of the earth, that you are a preventative from the culture around us uh, spoiling. Now in Corinthians, which the, the book that we're going to be looking at, in Corinthians, Paul writes this letter uh, to the Corinthian church. And in a similar way, he uses an imagery around the impact that Christians can have in the world around us. And he uses this imagery of a, uh, I love it in verse 15, it talks about a life-giving uh, perfume. Uh, a, a, the aroma of Christ to the world around us. And we know that, that when there's a nice smelling perfume, it smells good. You kind of, well, hopefully you wanna kind of be around that person. Or, uh, and so we, um, Paul describes that you are the aroma of Christ, that you, in, as you engage with, with just people around you in your workplace, in your university, the neighbourhood in which you live, the school that you go to, where you go to the gym, whatever it might be, as you uh, surround yourself, as you live your life out, as you serve people, as you love on people, People, you become the aroma of Christ uh, in and through uh, people's lives. Now, we don't do this on our own. We don't do this in our own strength, but it's the empowerment of God as He empowers us to be the aroma of Christ uh, around us. Uh, last uh, Wednesday night, our, our young ads are uh, still meeting in connect groups through the season. It looks a little bit different at the moment. Normally we'd meet together every week and we'd break up into our different connect groups. And at the moment, it looks a little bit different, but we're still gathering together around once a month and they're still doing their connect groups uh, in between all of that. But last Wednesday night, we gathered together and we uh, were up on the top property there. We did a bit of a bonfire night, but as part of it, I asked a, a friend uh, to come and speak. It was because a recent friend, I suppose. Uh, but I asked him to come and speak to uh, the young adults. And uh, his story is quite a remarkable story. And I wanna share it with you because even through his story, we see the impact of, of people in his life that were the aroma of Christ to him and how his life uh, was transformed. Now, I'm gonna have to give you a quick version. It's quite an extensive, remarkable story, but I'll, I'll give you a quick version of it. Basically, from he grew up in a family that was just, uh, a lot of his family were drug addicted 
addicted. And at 12, 13 years old, he was already on um, methamphetamines, uh, on drugs. Uh, by the time he's late teens, he's a full-blown drug addict and he's dealing drugs. His parents were both drug addicts, uh, brothers and sisters, his grandma, I think, his, uh, his grandpa, he spoke about being a uh, smoking uh, marijuana constantly. And this was the, the environment, this was the life that he lived. And in his late teenage years, he decided he wanted to get away from this just drug lifestyle. He wanted to try and get out of this. And so he decided he needed to move away. They were living at Melbourne at the time. He needed to move away from Melbourne to get away, to start afresh. And so of all places to get away from the drug scene, he moved to surface paradise on the Gold Coast. He moved to Service Paradise to get away from the drug scene. And sure enough, it wasn't too long before he found himself back in uh, to the drug scene. And he desperately wanted to get out of that, but it was so powerful. The addiction was so strong in his life. He had one person, there was one person in his life though, an auntie of all his family, extended family. This auntie was a Christian lady. And for 17 years, he spoke about how she prayed for him constantly. She prayed that, that God would break uh, into his life. Uh, and I, I don't remember the timeline perfectly, but it's quite a remarkable journey. But I, I think around his early 20s, uh, every year his auntie would write him cards for his birthday. He said whenever he would uh, go and be with his auntie, he never felt condemned or judged by his auntie, but he would always walk away feeling valued and loved. There was something different about his auntie that made such a tremendous impact on his life. Every year she would write cards, birthday cards to him saying, God has a plan for your life. I am praying for you. And she would often write Jeremiah 29, 11, for I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you and harm you, uh, plans to give you a hope and a future. And he would read these cards and say, here's my auntie again going off about the Christian stuff and he kind of throw it aside or whatever. And one year in his early 20s, again, it was his birthday. He got a card from his auntie, similar stuff. I'm praying for you, I'm praying for you. God's got a plan for your life. He kind of just, yeah, okay, thanks. And uh, he got a phone call the next night from his mother. He was in service paradise. He was about to just go and get a, a hit from someone to meet up with someone to get some drugs off them. And as he gets a phone call from his mum, uh, she says, did you ring your auntie to thank her for the card? He said, oh, no, I haven't. She said, the least you could do is just ring your auntie. And he thought to himself, I'm about to meet this person, get some drugs, I'll just make a quick phone call to say thanks and I'll, and, and I'll be on my way. He makes a phone call and all of a sudden as he calls, his auntie picks up the phone and she just says, hello. And he said the most powerful thing took place. As she said, hello, he said, I have never experienced anything like this before, but it was like this, this powerful love. As she said that word, powerful love, almost like came through the phone and impacted him and came upon him in such a way, he was faced with a huge dilemma. He had two decisions to make. He either pranks call, prank calls his auntie and just hangs up or he falls to the ground and bursts into tears with this, uh, 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 um, this love that just came over him. And he said in that moment, he did the later and he ended up falling to the ground and burst into tears as he experienced this encounter, this love. He'd never experienced anything like it before. And he burst into tears. Now, again, I don't know the exact timeline, but as time went on, he's wrestling with this drug addiction that he's dealing with. And he wants so desperately to move on and get out of this. And one night he ends up walking over to this local church that was nearby, Surf City Church. And as he walked into the church, he discovered the church service times and on the side of the building was Jesus saves or something like that or Jesus is our message. He goes into the building and that night a guy preached the gospel and he was impacted and he responded and he went down the front and he responded to Christ that night but he left with still so much baggage, so much stuff in his life that he needed to work through. A couple of weeks later, someone got in contact, sorry, that week someone got in contact with him and was working with him and said, come away with us as a church. We do like an encounter weekend at Mount Tambourine. So he goes away, goes to Mount Tambourine uh, again, he encounters God in such a powerful way. But that Sunday after coming back from the weekend, he's sitting alone in his unit uh, on, in Surface Paradise. And this thought comes to mind, I could text someone now and get another hit of drugs. He's wrestling with this. He's struggling with this addiction that's so strong in his life. But he's thinking, why? Why am I still having to deal with this? I heard the preacher on that Sunday night service say, God is the God of the impossible, that God can do anything. And he ends up falling on the ground and he 
he's crying out to God in great desperation. And he said he was pounding the ground saying, God, when will you take this away from me? When will you take this addiction away from me? And he just heard, not, not an audible voice, but deep in his heart, a clear word that said 726. He sort of sat upright and he looked around the room. What is going on? As he scanned the room, he scanned past the microwave and then he looked back at the microwave and on the microwave was the time, 7.26. And that moment on, he never had a drug again. And God healed him of that addiction right then and there. And God said, I'm gonna use you as a, uh, I'm gonna use your life to impact the lives around you. He went on to become a youth and young adults pastor. And then he's done in the last nine years, itinerant speaking uh, throughout all sorts of different countries, encouraging and empowering, encouraging the church to keep pressing on and to keep being the aroma of Christ in which we're talking about uh, here today. And he's just come back to Australia now uh, through COVID and planted themselves back on the Gold Coast. But what's remarkable about this story is that you, you, that's so powerful. There's different aspects of his story. But what I thought was so powerful is here's this auntie, 17 years of prayer, painstaking prayer, crying and pleading with God, break into his life. She was the aroma of Christ in this man's life. And the impact is extraordinary as he's had an impact on many people's lives. It's quite funny, my wife went to his Go conferences when she was a teenager at Surf City Church. He used to say to me, David, you've got to get Lucas out. Get Lucas out. And, uh, and it's remarkable the impact he's had. But his auntie was the aroma of Christ in his life. And this morning, Paul writes to the Corinthians and he says, if you're a follower of Christ, you are the aroma of Christ to the world in which you live, to the people around you where uh, God has placed you, the very street in which you live in. Did you know you're the pastor of your street? There's people in your street that God wants to reach. And, who, who's, and it happens to be, if you're a Christian here, you happen to live in the house that you live in. It's not a mistake that God has blessed you with that house. It's not a mistake that you live in the street that you live in. It's not a mistake you live in the suburb that you live in. Wouldn't it be great for God to bring a revival in your suburb? Wouldn't that be amazing? Who's it, who's it gonna be? It's you. He's gonna use you. You're the pastor. You're the pastor of your street, your suburb. You are the aroma of Christ in your suburb. So I know for many of you this morning and watching online, for many of you will be thinking, yeah, but you don't know my story. I've got nothing to offer. I I've got nothing to give. Wrong. As we surrender to God, uh, He uses us. It's not our strength. It's not our ability. It's not our talents. It's His power in and through us that's gonna make the difference in the world around us, that's gonna make the difference in the lives around us. You are the aroma of Christ, as Paul talks about here. In, into the church in Corinth. You are the aroma of Christ. Now in this, this uh, letter that Paul writes, in, in this first part, it's kind of, it, it kind of seems quite depressing up until around chapter two, which we pick up on. But, but Paul is talking here about the difficulties and the trials that he's been going through. He talks about his hardships suffered in Asia, the criticism of integrity that he's had to face, the pain experienced in Corinth and his inability to settle to preaching in trials. And so he speaks about these things. And then in verse 14, chapter two, which we're gonna pick up on, it'll come up on the screen maybe. In, in verse 14, he says this, but thank God, but thank God he has made us his captives and continues to lead us along in Christ's triumphal, triumphal procession. It's a bit of a tongue twister, I'm sorry. He continues to lead us along in Christ's triumphal procession. So what is Paul talking about here? He's saying, hey, we're a part of something bigger than ourselves here. That we know the world in which we live, there's, there's good and evil and there's a war that rages around us. Paul uses an imagery here. Uh, now in the first century, they would have been aware of this, but he uses an imagery of the Roman Empire at that time as the Romans went out to battle and if they defeated uh, another army, that they would march them back through the city in a triumphal procession and those that were captured were caught as slaves and they would march them through and people would gather around and watch on and the commander of the army would follow behind the, those that were slaves uh, walking through the city. And Paul is talking about this triumphal procession here of Christ. 
Now, now commentators have, you know, wrestled with this idea. What's Paul saying here that we're the slaves at the front or we the, the victors at the back that, you know, what does that look like? And, and I think there's a general consensus that Paul is saying, hey, I'm part of the slaves at the front, but what a great commander. If I'm gonna serve any commander or be a slave to any commander, what a great commander to be a slave of than Christ himself as he leads us on this great, uh, um, this great um, triumphal procession. What an amazing king to serve. And so, uh, and Paul talks about this as well throughout his different letters. He talks about how he's a slave to Christ. His life is no longer his own. Now, like I said, we know that we're in a spiritual battle. We've just come out of a series of, of the, you know, the spiritual warfare that we've been looking at. And we know that from the beginning of fall of humanity, there's been a battle that has raged. And God created a perfect world for, for humanity to love one another, to love Him, to look outward. But in our own uh, pride, we've turned against God and we've looked inward rather than loving upward towards Him and towards others. And through that, Satan comes into the story and he causes destruction and we've gone our own way. And there's been this battle that's raged as God out of His love and mercy for humanity has, tried, has made a way, has made a way for humanity to have a restored relationship with God. And the battle rages. Jesus said, the enemy comes to steal, kill and destroy, but I have come that they may have life and life to the full. So we're involved in this battle. But God is a missionary God that comes to draw people back to Himself. He loves humanity. Have you ever heard this before? Have you ever heard people say, I don't know how you could believe in a God that sends people to hell. How could you believe in a God that sends people to hell? Well, to be quite honest, I couldn't believe in a God that sends people to hell, no way. But that's, that's sometimes the misconception. You see, God doesn't send people to hell. God has made a way so that people wouldn't have to go to hell. He, he gave His own Son up so that so people wouldn't have to experience hell. But when we go against God and His plan, when we come out of a relationship with God, we lose God is love, God is peace, His joy, all these good things. And when we don't have God, we have hell. We have the absence of God. We have the absence of all these things. We have hell now and we have hell forevermore. But God isn't a God that sends people to hell. His love and compassion for humanity is, come to me, come to me, I'll forgive you. And, I'll, and, I'll, and you don't have to experience the hell that sometimes we experience in this life and the life to come. And so he makes a way. He's the missionary God that, that just as God began this, this, as he sends his son into the world, this, this missionary God to restore humanity to himself, he sends us out Likewise, to be healing agents. Likewise, to be the aroma of Christ in the world around us. Remember Jesus said, he said, it's actually said to his disciples, it's actually better that I go. Now they would have been thinking, how is that better? You're, you're God, the son of the, uh, you know, God himself, the son of the living God. How is it better that you go? He said, because then I will send you the helper. He'll empower you and, and, and you'll go out and impact the world around you. You are the aroma of of Christ, the missionary God sending us out. I love this quote by Daryl Gouda. He writes this, we have come to see that mission is not merely an activity of the church, rather mission is the result of God's initiative rooted in God's purposes to restore and heal creation. Mission means sending. And it is the central biblical theme describing the purpose of God's action in human history. You see, this is at the center of God's heart. Jesus said, I have come uh, to seek and to save which was lost. This is the central theme of God's heart towards humanity. And what is so exciting is this, is that He invites you in to be a part of the mission that He is doing in the world around us. I don't know about you, but I find that incredibly thrilling, incredibly exciting that the creator of the universe, the great king, the God of, of this universe, the one who spoke the world into being says, now I want to use your life to be a healing agent in the world around you, to be the aroma of Christ around you. I find that incredibly thrilling to feel that I can be a part of that. I love that quote by C.T. Uh, sorry, C. T. Studd. He says this, he says, some wish to live within the sound of church and chapel bell. He says, I wanna run a rescue shop within a yard of hell. And I love that. 
Here's a man that sees what's at stake here. If this is true, if it's real, I'm not saying it is, but, but, but if it's true and it's real, I, I'm convinced it is, but that's for you to, to, to work out and decide. But if this is real, then this is so significant. This is huge. Actually, I, I didn't say this in the first one, but there's a, the, again, I think C.T. Studd read this once and he was so impacted by this. It's a quote I jotted down and it says this by a guy by the name of Norman Grubb. He says this, he says, if I firmly believed as millions say they do, that the knowledge of a practice of religion in this life influences the destiny in another, then religion would mean to me everything. I would cast away earthly enjoyments as dross, earthly thoughts and feelings as vanity. Religion would be my first waking thought and my last image before sleep sank me into unconsciousness. I should labour in its cause alone. I would take thought for the marrow of eternity alone. I would esteem one soul, he says, I would esteem one soul gained for heaven worth a life of suffering. That's a challenging sentence. Is that how our heart is? I would, uh, enjoyments as droth. Religion would be my cause alone. I would take thought for the marrow of eternity alone. I would esteem one soul gained for heaven worth a life of suffering. Earthly consequences would never stay in my head or seal my lips. Earth, its joys and its griefs would occupy no moment of my thoughts. I would strive to look upon eternity alone and on the immortal souls around me, soon to be everlastingly happy or everlastingly miserable. I would go forth to the world and preach to it in season and out of season. And my text would be, what shall it profit a man if he gains the whole world but loses his own soul? And C.T. Studd was so impacted by this, so impacted, he thought, I've got to go. And C.T. Studd was a great missionary and had a great impact for God as he, God used him to be the aroma of Christ in and through his life. You know, I had an amazing uh, phone call and I'll just be very vague around this because I don't think she'll mind, but I just had a phone call from somebody just in this past week. But uh, just, just seeking and searching and, and sort of uh, come along to uh, a Young Ads Once, came along last week and, and, and that very speaker was impacted by that speaker and I was just uh, called her, just she was wanting to find out a little bit more about connect groups and getting involved in community. And she just shared a little bit and she just shared about the fact that, you know, she's really searching. She's looking for something more, which I could totally relate to. That was my story. That was my journey. And she said, everything that speaker spoke about last week is my story. I'm just, I feel lost. I feel lost. And I'm looking for something more. I'm desperate for, for something more. And I had just an opportunity just to chat with her. And then I said, look, this might be weird, but do you mind if I just pray for you? We chatted for a while. Do you mind if I pray for you at the end? And I just prayed and, and uh, you know, I just said, I, I'm convinced God has a plan for you and, and that God is, you know, if we're genuine about it and we ask God to reveal himself to us, that he will reveal himself to you. And she was, you know, impacted by that and, and, uh, and just such an amazing opportunity. And I don't know about you, but I come off the, the back of either these phone calls or catch ups with, with people that are on a journey of searching and there's something, in, there's an energy that comes like, not some weird worldly energy thing, but, but like, a, like a sense of, of thrill and excitement about when people are exploring and wanting to know more or they come to faith. Like we have baptisms in this church and there's nothing more exciting than when people encounter God and their lives are turned upside down and they experience how God good our heavenly father really is. There's nothing better. I spoke to another friend of mine earlier in the week. He had an opportunity earlier in the week um, to share the gospel with somebody else and they shared and, and he said he got off the phone and he was jumping around his room going, this is amazing. This is so exciting because there's a thrill that comes when people encounter or people are searching the love of God. It is so thrilling. And I don't know about you, but I, I, just, I just feel like in the world around us that there are people looking for hope. There are people looking for purpose and meaning to life and in many situations looking in the wrong ways, but I'm convinced that God is the way, the truth and the life. And when they encounter Him, they encounter, there's nothing better you could ever encounter in your life. And He wants to use you. Don't you get it? Don't you see it? He wants to use you. You are the aroma of Christ in these people's lives. You say, I could never be the aroma of Christ in my workplace. You don't know where I work. I could never be the aroma of Christ in my, in my street or my university or the school or the gym that I go to. Yes, you can. Yes, it's not based on our strength or ability. We'll never achieve anything fruit, long-lasting, eternal fruit doing it in our own strength. 
But when you surrender to God and He comes in, you'll be the aroma of Christ. You'll serve and you'll lay down your life and you'll love on people and people will impact and they think, what, what is that about you? What, what is that? It's the aroma of Christ. And all of a sudden, opportunities might open up to just share about why you are the way that you are, what, what the, the hope that you have that lies within your heart. This is the heart of God. And so Paul goes on to say, now He uses us. Verse 14, but thank God He's made us His captives and continues to lead us along in Christ's triumphal procession. But now He uses us to spread the knowledge of Christ everywhere like a sweet perfume, a sweet perfume to the lives around us. Notice He uses that word, He uses us. It's, it's all encompassing. The moment you come to faith, a commission falls on your life. You may not even realise it, but a commission falls on your life. And that commission is, I want you to go and make disciples. It's not a thought or a good idea. It's a commission. It's a command actually from your Saviour that I want you to go and to be a witness. I want you to go and fulfil this commission that I've commanded you to do. Now, granted, I understand For some of you that are sitting here, you're saying, but I just can't do that. Yes, some are gifted to be evangelists, absolutely, but all have been called to evangelize. And I'm not saying that you've got to become a different person because, you know, I I, I get it. Sometimes, and evangelists are shocking at this. I, I shared this in the first service, but sometimes, you know, evangelists will get up and from the stage and they'll share these amazing stories. And they'll share stories about how I was on an aeroplane and I sat next to this guy and all of a sudden I started talking to him and I shared the gospel with him. He fell on the floor and his knees repenting. Then I got up and preached the whole plane. There was people falling into the aisles. Uh, The cabin crew were, you know, falling into the aisles. It was just amazing. The whole plane got saved and we landed and they all went off to their different countries and became missionaries. And it's an amazing story, don't get me wrong. It's an amazing story. The only problem is this, isn't it? Everyone who's sitting there is going, that's incredible, but I could never do that. Because it's, there's, there's fear that conjures up within our hearts. How are people going to perceive me? What am I going to say? I don't know how I'll be able to explain this. Don't become different or don't change your lifestyle. Be who you are and be salt and light where you are. An act of kindness, an invitation. Uh, you know, some of the simplest things in a world that is decaying, some of the simplest things that you can do is so... Uh, profoundly kind these days that people are just thinking, what, what, what is that? Why did you do that? And it leads to opportunities which to speak into people's lives, to be the aroma of Christ. Even Billy Graham himself said, you know, and he's, he's, a, he's a man that has preached from the stage, has seen thousands, millions maybe, come to faith in Christ. But even Billy Graham would say, there is nothing more powerful than personal relationship when it comes to outreach. Yes, he's preached from stages, but personal relationship. God's people on the move being the aroma of Christ in the people around them, one-on-one, connecting with people and loving people and valuing people and not treating people like a project, but saying, hey, God has poured his life out into mine and I can pour my life out into others. Regardless of what they might decide to do, that is up to God. But my role is to love on these people and value these people and pour my life out into the people around me. And you can do that. You can do that. You can be the aroma of Christ where you are. And God will use you to impact the lives around you. I understand that for some of you watching online, for some of you here in the auditorium, it may feel like it just sounds like you're preaching a project. And I apologise deeply if it comes across like that. And I recognise that some of you may be watching this saying, I'm not a Christian, but I'm exploring this stuff. And I need to say this, and I might not do a very good job, but if you are listening and you think it just sounds like we're a project, that's not my intention or my heart, and I apologise for that. But if you're here this morning, I want you to know that this is the way I kind of see it. If this is true, if it's real, if that people end up living somewhere, heaven or hell, that you could imagine it would, be like, uh, it would be like someone having a terminal illness, maybe terminal cancer and coming and knowing that they are gonna die. But in your top pocket, you literally have the cure, like a pill, uh, the cure for their terminal illness. And it would be like us standing there talking to them and them laying out the fact that they're gonna die, there is no hope for them. And in your top pocket, you have the answer and the key, but you decide, I'm not sure you know, what to do or how to respond here, so I just won't give it to them. 
And, and if that person found out, could you imagine they would be thinking, how could they do that? Why would they do that? Why would they withhold that from me? How could they be so selfish? And so if you're watching or listening and you're thinking, it sounds like a project, you, you, please forgive, forgive, forgive me, forgive us if it seemed like that. It's not a project. We just are absolutely convinced that this is life or death and that we really believe that Jesus is the answer to the problem of humanity, which is the problem of sin. And this is why we have to share it. I mean, I would feel so selfish if I am convinced that, that Jesus was the answer to humanity and I didn't share it with others. I just, I couldn't, I can't cope sometimes with the thought of that. This is why we have to share it. Now, like I said, I recognise that uh, for, for many of you, you're thinking, but I don't know how to do this. And there's fear that rises up within your heart and I get that. But you know, you don't need to be totally different. You don't need to change who you are. Just be who you are, but ask God. Just continue to be that aroma of Christ and the people around you. God will open up the doors. Actually, I didn't share this in the first. Oh, I can't. This is recorded. Some other neighbours had a great story, but I better not share it. But, uh, but uh, um, uh, no, I will share. I will share very briefly. I remember the other day, I was just working in the backyard and some, there were some neighbours behind us. And, and as I was... Um, as I was working away, I remember just thinking, oh, you know, I've chatted to them quite a bit and we've chatted. And I remember thinking, God, you know, like, you know, I should probably, and, and I should probably share, you know, a bit more with these guys. And, and as I was working away, and this is a, a confession, really, I was working away, I thought, oh, I'm working here in the back. I don't want to, you know, I, don't, I really wouldn't want to do that right now. I'm confessing now. That's how I felt. And maybe you felt the same. Maybe it's just me. I don't know. But I thought, oh, I, don't, I wouldn't want to do that right now. I'm busy or whatever. And I went into the garage and I grabbed some tools out. And then I felt this conviction. Like God was like, oh, as if, you know, oh, that's not the right attitude. And I was like, oh, yeah, I feel terrible. I'm so sorry, God. And so I prayed this prayer. This is no word of a lie. I prayed this prayer. I said, well, God, if you want me to talk to them, then okay, I'll talk to them about you. You know, that's what I prayed. Now, I'm just confessing that because I feel the weight of this too. Sometimes we're busy. Life's busy, isn't it? Are you guys busy? Everyone's busy. Just ask someone how they're going. They're busy. Everyone's busy. And we, don't have, we feel like we don't have time for this. And I said, okay, so a simple prayer. I said, okay, God, I, if it came up, I'd talk to them about you. I, I promise I will. I went back and I hopped up the ladder. As I hopped up the ladder, I came over above the fence and here's uh, you know, one of my neighbours and a friend just sitting out there having a beer. And he said, oh, g'day, mate. I said, oh, how's it going? And he said, hey, by the way, I've been meaning to ask you, what do you do for a living? <laughs> no word of a lie. I got a tool in my garage. I said, okay, God, I'll share. And I said, <laughs> I said well, it's, that's a, I'm actually a pastor of a church. Really? A pastor of a church? He said, how did that come about? I said, well, let me tell you. And I thought, my goodness, a prayer. I went into the garage, grabbed the tool, a prayer. Okay, God, if it came up, I'd share. I promise I'll share. I walk out, so I climb the ladder. What do you do for a living? I'm a pastor of a church. How did that come about? Well, let me tell you. It's all started when I was younger and had no purpose to life. It just came about like that. I wasn't intentionally going out of my way. I'm gonna get next door and I'm gonna get the Bible and shove it down their throat and get stuck into them. That's not, our, that's not, that's not what it's about. Sometimes it's a simple prayer. Sometimes it's, a, uh, you know, uh, sometimes it's, a, um, it's getting in proximity sometimes with people that, that don't know Christ. And I'd be the first to admit that, you know, since coming to faith and getting involved in church and now working, you know, at a church, I look at my friendship group and I look at the, the world in which I live and my world is a pretty church world. Like it's very church world. I... There are not too many people in my life that, that don't sort of know Christ. And I, all my friendship groups, all the people around me are mostly Christian. And, and I recognise that sometimes as a problem, actually, because if this is a command and a commission on my life, I want you to go and impact people's lives. You know, it's hard to reach, you know, reaching pastors. They already know. They're like, yeah, we know David, you know. And, uh, you know, so, so there's sometimes we've got to take some initiative to say, actually, God, I just need to step out and, and, and get in proximity and get involved in other people's lives that maybe don't know him and just pour out my life into their lives. And so, we, you know, recently I uh, had an opportunity a little while ago, uh, just through Red Frogs, they take away all these uni students away uh, to Fraser Island. Uh, so, so we took away, just took a couple of days off and, and we went away uh, to Fraser and I, I was 
you know, driving some students, took some students in my car. There was other drivers that took these students, about 40 to 50 uni students away to Fraser Island. And again, we're not preaching and jamming the Bible down people's throats. We're just, we're just living it out. We're living in, in proximity with them and we're taking them to uh, different parts of Fraser Island and all sorts of stuff. Now, I certainly prayed before I left. I said, well, God, if you wanna open up some doors here, I, I'm open. If anyone asks and these uni students ask about, you know, um, faith or anything like that, then I, I'm open. And so I'm praying into it. And, and so there on one of the days, we're taking all these uni students to Lake McKenzie and there's all these four drives lined up. And I had four students in my car, a couple of girls and a couple of guys. And we start heading to Lake McKenzie. Now it's a long drive. And uh, right at the start of this trip, one of them says, so <laughs> here it is again. So what do you do for work? And I said, oh, I'm actually the pastor of a church. And they said, oh my gosh, <laughs> like how did that come about? And I said, well, uh, well, <laughs> It all started when I was younger. Now, I'm always gauging, like, are they actually interested in this story or not? But as I'm starting to share, and it's a long drive, it's probably an hour drive, inland forward driving to get to Lake McKenzie. And, 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 and I start saying, you know, when I was younger, I had no purpose to life. And I start sharing and sharing and they're engaged. I mean, asking questions. I'm saying, okay, Lord, as long as people are engaged, I'll keep sharing. And I get to the point in my story where I say, but it got to a point where I ended up sitting on the edge of my bed one night and I didn't understand the fullness of all of this, but I, res- I, I, I surrendered my life to God. I, I, I gave my life to Him. And all of a sudden I spoke about, all of a sudden I experienced a peace and a joy and a contentment and I never experienced anything like that before. And I knew in that moment as I'm sharing, I'd been sharing for about half an hour this journey and they were so engaged. And as I looked in the rear vision mirror, the two girls sitting in the back, tears are streaming down their faces. I spoke about a God who brought purpose to my life, meaning to my life, joy and peace and contentment. And they're crying, they're crying, impacted. I didn't go about thinking that was gonna happen, but I just decided, hey, I need to go away. I need to get in proximity with people that maybe don't know God and maybe God will do something in it. I didn't try and orchestrate it. I just made myself available. Now in your own life, you can do that. Making yourself available, getting involved with other people. It may be an act of kindness and I know I've used a bit of time. Let me just list a couple more things. It may be an act of kindness. Recently, just uh, some neighbours up the street a little bit and around the corner, uh, I noticed were struggling a little bit. Um, her husband was going through some health uh, issues and concerns. Now, I can't do a lot in my life. I'm not, I'm not, very, I'm not very gifted. I can't do too much. One thing I can do is I, I'm practical. I can mow some lawns. I can, I'm a carpenter. You know, my background's carpentry. So I can do some practical stuff. And that's what I can do. And I noticed that her husband was really unwell. And so I just went and spoke to her a couple of times and said, hey, you know, I could come and just mow your lawn or whatever. She was impacted by that and done that a couple of times. And, and on this one occasion, I mowed her lawn or whatever. And, and uh, you know, I was just leaving to go back home. And she said, you know, she was, really, she was really just upset with the whole situation with her husband who's quite unwell. And she said, she knows, you know, uh, that I go to church. She knows what I do. And she said, you know, David, I don't know about all this. And she was quite impact, you know, emotional. And she said, you know, you're a religious person. I'm not religious, but you know what I mean. She said, you're, you're religious. What, what, where, where's God in all of this? What, why is this happening? And all of a sudden, out of the blue, I'm standing there in her lounge room and I said, you know, I, I'm convinced this was not God's intention. This isn't God's intention that God created a world that was perfect. But do you know what? One day he's gonna restore everything right again. He's gonna heal all of this, this mess, this sin in this world in which we live. And she's crying, there she is. A lot of people are crying around me, aren't they? Um, and she's crying. Tears are coming down her face, impacted as I speak life and love into this person's life that is searching for hope. Where is God in the midst of this sickness? I didn't go about thinking that was what was gonna happen. You're just an act of kindness. You can do that. An act of kindness to the people around you. It may be an invitation. I read in my devotion this past week, it's a great story, I'll quickly share it with you, but I read in my devotion by Angus Buck and he said that he was away preaching somewhere doing these campaigns, he's a South African evangelist if you haven't heard about Angus, but he's, he was away preaching in these campaigns and he was preaching the gospel and, and doing a few nights in a row and one 16 year old girl with her mother came the very first night and she responded to Christ and came to faith. And she came back the next night and Angus had this, uh, this, this wording in there. He said, you know, sometimes uh, I've heard it said uh, that some of the greatest evangelists or outreachers are, are, are brand new Christians because they just, they don't know any better. They just come to faith and they're just, wow, this is amazing. They just go about telling other people. And this 16 year old girl came to faith in the first night. She was there with her mum on the second night. And as he gets up to start preaching Angus, this 16 year old girl feels this sort of prompting in her heart 
that I need to go outside because there's a fisherman. They must have been somewhere near the, the sea or whatever. There's a fisherman on the beach that needs Jesus. This is what she feels in her heart. And she thinks to herself, well, I gotta go. And so she gets up, Angus has just got up and says, she gets up, she leaves the auditorium. Now, by the way, if any of you need to do this in this moment, feel totally free, I won't mind. She gets up, she leaves uh, the, the, the session, she walks down onto the beach and she walks up to the first fisherman she sees and she says, excuse me, do you need Jesus? And he looks at her and says, oh, no, nah, no, nah, I'm all right. Like, no. Now, if that was me, uh, I don't know about you, but if that was me, I would have thought, oh, gosh, God, what was that about? And I would have walked straight back and thought, oh, look at me, I look like a fool because my pride often gets in the way. But she wasn't deterred. She said, oh, okay, no worries. She just walked along the beach to the next fisherman. And she said, excuse me, do you need Jesus? And he said, oh, no, no, I don't need Jesus. I'm okay. And she goes, oh, okay, no worries. She walked along to the third fisherman. She said, excuse me, do you need Jesus? And he said, actually, yeah, I do. I do. I need Jesus. And she says, oh, come with me. And she walks this fisherman, waders and fishing rod and all. She walks this fisherman up into the, the campaign where, the, where Angus was preaching. They walked into the back of this church or stadium, probably stadium actually for him now. Uh, it, it, oh, maybe not that big. Anyway, uh, she walks in the back there and there he is, waders and fishing rod. And Angus preaches the gospel. He calls for response. And the first, Angus said in devotion, the first person that came forward, this fisherman with his fishing rod and his waders, and he knelt with him at the front as he responded to Christ. Amazing story. It was an invitation. Yes, yeah, certainly a prompting and obedience as part of that as well, but an invitation to come and see. You can do that. You can do that. An act of kindness, an invitation, getting, in, uh, getting involved in people around us that don't know Christ. Paul goes on to say, our lives are Christ-like fragrance rising up to God, but this fragrance is perceived differently by those who are being saved and by those who are perishing. To those who are perishing, we are a dreadful smell of death and doom. But to those who are being saved, I love this, listen to this. But to those that are being saved, we are a life-giving perfume. And who is adequate for such a task as this to which all of us might say, I'm not adequate, I can't do it, don't worry. Paul doesn't answer it there, but in chapter three and verse five, he goes on to say, the competency comes through God. We're not able, we're not adequate, but as He empowers us, we are the aroma of Christ and He impacts lives through us. I just wanna say this, I'm gonna close. It could be that even out of today, you walk out of here. My prayer is that you'd say, hey, those seem like simple things. I could do that. It may be as you go, and this is probably the most important thing anyway, as you go this afternoon, you begin by just praying, start there. And that you would pray. Remember the story at the start I told you, an auntie who prayed for 17 years and the impact has been remarkable. Maybe you go away and you say, okay, God, I need to pray about this. And you start praying. I remember hearing to go into this prayer session thing and, and these speakers had come and spoke about prayer. And they said, sometimes prayer is like breathing in. It's like inhaling God and His character and His heart. And then when you exhale, it's that, that natural, I have to go out now. As you take on the heart of God, the exhale is the going out. You feel um, compelled, I must go, I must go. Begin there, pray. I just wanna say this. I hear this story a little while ago. It's a powerful story. There's a, a man by the name of Edwin R. Orr, and he was a he studied all the revivals throughout history. Revivals where God has come and impacted really the world through certain people. He's got a doctorate in it, doctorate in it and he went around the world studying these these revivals. And he shares a story one time that he he was a lecturer as well. He, he lives in the stuff. He's, he's passed away now, I think, but he lectured. He lived in the states. And he would take on these, these students and he would lecture around revivals, quite remarkable. You can YouTube and, and, and hear him share on these topics. But he, this one time he took a group of students, just a small group, it was about 10 students away with him and they went on almost like an excursion and he took them to, I think it was Charles Wesley's house, Charles or John Wesley, one of the brothers. And, and if you know about Charles and John Wesley, they had extraordinary impact. God used their life a similar time actually to George Whitfield uh, to see like droves and droves, thousands, maybe millions of people come to faith uh, through the way that God used their lives. And so Edwin R. Orr takes these students to Charles Wesley's house and they're going through Wesley's house. They go through downstairs and they get up and they go sort of up to the top of the stairs, they go upstairs and they, they're looking around. Charles Wesley's house is amazing. As they go into his bedroom, they notice there's sort of a bed there. It's kind of set up so that people can go and visit Charles Wesley's house. There's a bed there. Now, beside the bed, a student notices that beside the bed, there's like these grooves indented into the hardwood floors beside the bed. 
One of the students says this. He says, what, what's with these grooves? And Edwin R. Orr says that was where he prayed, all constantly prayed and sought God. And he prayed so often that it made these perfect knee grooves in the hardwood floors where he poured out his heart and he cried out to God in prayer that God might do something powerful in his time. And God did. And so they looked at this. It was quite powerful, the students. And then he said, come on, let's, let's head off. And the students went back downstairs and they all hopped back in the bus. There was about 10 students as Edwin R. Orr got back in the bus, he sort of just counted to make sure everyone was there. There was only nine students in the bus. He thought, oh, someone still must be in there. He got back off the bus, went back inside, went downstairs, couldn't see anyone. He went upstairs, and as he went upstairs, there was a student, there was a student by Charles Wesley's bed, and all he could see was the shoulders and his head. And he was kneeling in the very grooves that Charles Wesley prayed, oh God, do a mighty work do a mighty work. And as he looked, he saw, and all he heard was this student kneeling there at the bed of Charles Wesley and praying this prayer, God, do it again. God, do it again. God, do it again. Again and again, he was praying on his knees in the very place that Wesley prayed. And he was praying, God, do it again. Do it again. And he kept repeating that prayer. And Edwin R. Orr went around the bed. He placed his hand on his shoulder and he said, it's time to go. And in that moment, Billy Graham stood to his feet as a young man. He went outside the house and he hopped back on the bus and they left. And here's the thing, God did it again. God did it again. And as I look around this room tonight, I see people that God might wanna do it again through. And the question is this, who is willing, who is available? Would we be willing to say, God, do it again in my life for the sake of this generation, for the sake of people's lives and people's souls? Oh God, do it again, please, please. You say, oh, no way, God can't use me. Of course He can use you. It's not your ability. You just surrender your life to God and He will use you to impact the lives around you. Oh God, may this be our prayer, do it again. Father, this is the cry of our heart. We've prayed it so many times that you might bring a revival to this community, to this city, to this nation, to this world, Almighty God. And in this moment, we sit, we listen on, on, online, whatever it might be, and we just cry out. We cry out from the bottom of our hearts, do it again, Almighty God. Oh God, we need you so desperately. This is life or death. If we believe this is truth, then this is life or death. And I just pray for every single person listening that you might stir afresh within our hearts, a revived heart, a surrendered heart, an awakening, a fresh awakening for the, for the kingdom, for your kingdom, for the people around us, for the souls that may be perishing who don't know this message, Almighty God. Please awaken us, Father. And I'm convinced, Lord, the first, but here now as well, there may be some, then we need to almost repent our hearts to you again. Repent of, repent of maybe our complacency. If you're sitting here now, if you're watching online, I wanna give you an opportunity just to respond to God and say, oh Lord, forgive me. It may be a, a response of forgiveness for where you spent your time and you know, you know you could have spent more time on your knees or spending with God. This, this isn't religion. This isn't about feeling guilty. This is just an opportunity to say, God, this is what I desire and I need help in this area. It's just a surrender into Him, a repentance of our time a repentance of our finances, a repentance of our resources, a repentance of our complacency, Almighty God. If that's you here at home, I want you to do something in this moment as we repent before God. Just where you're seated, it's not a big thing, but if you'd like to come before God and say, oh God, awaken my heart afresh. I want you to put your hands out in front of you, maybe just on your lap, but put your hands out in front of you, your palms facing up saying, Lord, I surrender. Oh God, I surrender afresh. You see every response, Lord, you see every heart, God. And we just pray by the power of the Holy Spirit that You'd come and touch people's hearts and lives right now as we repent before You and say, oh Lord, we don't wanna live a life of complacency, but a life of, of surrender to You, a life of yieldedness to You, a life of deep, deep uh, uh, longing for You, Father God. You see these hearts. And so Almighty God, we just pray You'd come in power. Come in power. And together now in this moment, we cry out, oh, Holy Spirit, come and do a work that only you can do. That you would come and bring revival to this city, this nation, this world, great God. 
And I'm convinced in this very room, God, that you want to use people. You want to use us. We thank you for it. Use our lives, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. And stand to our feet together. Come on, let's worship this great God. Even in this song as you sing, just if you want to, this is the amazing thing, that you can just talk to God yourself. You don't need to go. uh, You don't need to go to somebody, uh, you know, for them to inquire or come to God on your behalf. You can speak directly to Him. And so in this song, as we worship our great God, feel free to just pray in your heart and in your mind and say, oh God, come and do something in my heart. Awaken my heart. Revive me, great God, I pray. But let's sing and worship to our great God this morning. What a blessing to be together this morning. Hear the Holy Spirit speak to us. It'd be wrong this morning, I think, for us to conclude this service if we didn't take a specific moment to pray for those that we know that don't know Jesus in our own lives, in our circle, in our influence. And so I want to invite you to do that right now, to name somebody here and our prayers are like incense. You realise that? It's like an aroma from here this morning and for those online too as well. I really encourage you to do this. So why don't we take a moment right now and you bow and you lift up names before the throne of God, our great God. Come, let's do that right now together, church, and those online as well, if you do that with us. Yeah. Oh, Lord, you're hearing these names. Break our hearts, Lord. But what breaks you? The lost people. Yeah. Empower us now, Holy Spirit. The specific prayers that have been prayed, Lord, if you want us to be involved in mission, Lord, then open up doors this very week, we pray. For some that have prayed for 17 years, others for 28 years, longer than that, Lord, we pray in Jesus' name. Hear this prayer. On this very morning, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. And there's one final prayer that I'd love us to pray this morning. In the early years of this church, we had an evangelist in this church. His name was Martin Luke. We sent him out to the Grove Church, out of Fernie Grove, playing a church out there. And we pray that God would give us another evangelist. And God has done that, has He not, in David? Are we not blessed, church, to have this man? Are we not blessed? We are. We thank God for your brother. We do thank God for you, David. Yeah. Yeah. And I believe this morning that we should take this opportunity to pray for the continued anointing on this man. There might be people you've prayed for just this moment of time that will come to know Jesus through the ministry of this man as others have already done so in this very church. So it's COVID safe time, so we can't put any hands on David just at the moment. But church, I want to invite you to lift your hands towards David down here in the front and ask that the Holy Spirit will anoint this man with continued power in his own ministry and encouraging us in the ministry. And I know there's other pastors here that are gifted as well. And we thank God for every person. These are the gifts of the body. But this morning it's about this man that we would pray for continued powerful anointing upon his life. I invite those that are online this morning to do exactly the same, just to raise a hand right where you are in your lounge room, wherever you might be watching this towards our brother, that he will be anointed by the power of the Holy Spirit. And so Lord, we pray that We pray this in Jesus' Name. We thank You for the gift of this man. Thanks for finding him, Lord. He had no purpose. He was in the darkness and then You brought him into the light, into the light of Jesus Christ. And what a blessing, Lord, He has been in this church over the years and continues to be to this very morning. And so, great God, continue, Lord, Your powerful anointing upon His life, Lord. He would be the man, Lord, too, that kneels before You and says, my life's available for You for whatever You want. And may there be thousands, tens of thousands. We don't wanna limit the work of the Holy Spirit through You, brother, this morning. But may Your life be anointed to see many, many people in this nation and beyond come into the Kingdom of God and experience the joy and the blessings that we know this very morning. And so, Lord, hear our prayer powerful anointing upon our brother. In Jesus' mighty Name we pray. And God's people said, Amen, Amen. 
I want to thank you all very much for coming this morning. It's great. Isn't it good to be a church? It's good to be a church. I know you're online as we love you too as well. You can come anytime. That'd be terrific. We're heading out to the left this morning. Don't forget that today will be good. If you want to bring an offering, then there's an opportunity to do that. It's been good. God's with us, church. And He's with our nation and He loves us. And so we thank Him for His beautiful presence here this morning. God bless you. And God bless you. And God bless you as well. In Jesus' Name we pray. Amen. 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 Well, thanks for joining with us for our service today. If you sense God speaking to you, we'd love to help you on the journey of faith. You can reach out to us by emailing hello at bridgman.org.au or if you have a prayer need, don't forget to email us at prayer at bridgman.org.au and we'd love to pray for you. Thanks so much for sharing with us today and we look forward to connecting with you again soon.